For centuries, people regarded plants as solely the creation of God, and some still do. Their variety had no human order to it. Plants were here to be celebrated, not questioned. As a botanist, I understand how plants are grouped into species. And yet, 300 years ago, this simple concept was highly controversial. To question the order of nature was to question God himself. In the late 17th century, scientific investigation began to erode religious certainty. The new discipline of botany was thinking about plants in new ways. What botanists were looking for, and are still looking for, is how the plant world fits together, understanding what is related to what. Grouping plants is what we botanists call classification, and it's not about making life easier for ourselves, though that would be nice. It's about revealing the natural order of the world. Classification of plants is the basis of the science of botany. Pioneering botanists really struggled to invent a system for naming plants so that knowledge could be passed on to future generations. And they began to glimpse a world where bigger, better, stronger plants could be created. For the first time, the study of plants rejected religious dogma and embraced science. Today, botany is at the forefront of advances that will affect all our lives. And how we got there is a tale of intrigue, of jealous rivalry, and of flawed genius. It's the story of how science unlocked the secrets of what for me is our most precious resource, plants. This is the University of Oxford Botanic Garden, tucked away in the city centre. I should at this point declare an interest because for 22 years I've been director of the most compact yet diverse collection of plants in the world. I have the benefit of centuries of accumulated knowledge because this is the oldest botanic garden in Britain. It was founded nearly 400 years ago to celebrate and encourage understanding of the plant kingdom. At its most basic level, botany enables us to distinguish between these three berries. And that's important because this is St John's wort used by some people to treat depression. This is deadly nightshade, which will kill you. And these are blackcurrants. Botany can also tell us which plants are related to each other. And that may not sound important, but it's been known for decades that this yew tree can be used to treat breast cancer. So it was logical to look at plants related to it to see if they also contained useful molecules. And sure enough, its cousin over there is now being used to treat leukaemia. This one example shows how important it is to define and to classify plants. The first major breakthrough in the classification of plants was made by a young man studying not here in Oxford, much as it pains me to say it, but in Cambridge. John Ray is a name most people have never heard of. Yet for me, he's one of the greatest naturalists ever. <laughs> 
As a student at Trinity College, and armed with nothing more than a hand lens and the personality of a 17th century geek, Ray glimpsed something that no one else had ever seen, a natural order. The 17th century was an exciting time to be a scientist. This was the era when Isaac Newton uncovered laws of physics. There are revolutions taking place in the world of science, and botany is one of them. John Ray's pioneering work on classification moved the study of plants away from superstition and towards science. Ray did what field botanists still do today. He went out into the field and he collected plants and he pressed them in his herbarium press and brought them home and observed them. The more he looked, the more he began to see a pattern emerging in the plants he'd collected. This pattern would be his first great discovery. Ray would have gone out into the Cambridge countryside and found purple loosestrife and purple loosestrife vary in a number of ways. They're, some are taller, some are shorter, some are paler flowers. Now, some people would have said these were fundamentally different. Ray said, no, this is just variation. You get different plants coming from seed that has been collected from the same plant. It's like my children have different coloured eyes, different coloured hair, but that doesn't mean they're a different species, probably. He argued that plants can look different and still be closely related to one another. He'd recognised natural variation between plants, and he went further. John Ray realised that there is a set of characters that remain unique to a group of plants, and in particular the flowers, and inside those flowers, the seeds, the seed vessel, and the outer parts of the flower, the sepals. These were the characteristics that didn't vary within a given species. These were the things that could be used to define a species. It may seem a bit strange today, but before Ray, no one knew what a species was, let alone how to identify one. For the first time, we had a clear definition of what was a species. And defining species in that way was a huge step forward for botanical science and was one of Ray's major contributions to botany. His progress was short-lived. Soon afterwards, Ray was kicked out of Cambridge. In 1660, the monarchy is restored following the death of Oliver Cromwell. On a point of principle, Ray refuses to swear a new oath of allegiance to King Charles II. Had he stayed at the university, he may well have become as famous as his contemporary Isaac Newton. Instead, he left Cambridge and walked away into obscurity. He exchanged the cloisters of Cambridge for rooms in a house owned by one of his students. This is Middleton Hall in Staffordshire. It's here that Ray made his next discovery. He defined a species by those characteristics of plants that don't change. Now he wanted to go further, to see if species themselves can be organised and grouped. He wanted to know if they could be classified. When John Ray was living here at Middleton Hall, he was able to get on with what he did best, which was looking at plants. He would collect things, bring them back, and he saw things that other people missed. He turned his attention to looking at seeds. Flowering plants produce seeds. They all look quite different. But when you cut them open, Ray discovered that there seem to be two sorts of seeds. When you take a bean seed and cut it open, it splits easily into two. He then started cutting open 
other seeds. And when he looked inside these seeds, he found that some, like this iris, didn't split nicely into two like that. There was just one structure in the middle. Ray had uncovered a fundamental split in the plant world. The first group that splits easily into two, he named the dicots, and the other, the monocots. As he looked at the overall structure of the plants in these two groups, he found five more significant differences in the flowers, in the stems, the roots, the first leaves to emerge, and the mature leaves. He realized that any further advances in classification could only come about by looking at the whole plant, all of its features bar none. The man was an absolute genius. He got it right. He created order out of the chaos that is nature. It's a testament to Ray's brilliance that his principles of classification are still taught to this day, 350 years later. So as chaplain to the household, he had a, was, there a, was there a chapel here, do we think? These are the rooms where Ray began to crack the code of classification. And then what's through here? Today, they're looked after by Dr Ian Dillamore, a trustee of Middleton Hall. Although it's open to the public and you can wander around and learn about his work, John Ray is hardly a household name. Well, he's not better known because he wrote his serious works in Latin and he could not afford to illustrate them. His humility and not pushing himself were, were very important as well. In the prefaces to all of his books, he apologises for putting the reader to the trouble of reading what he has to say. <laughs> uh, that's terrific. You know, does the world need another book like this, he keeps on asking. Uh, and, uh, of course, the answer is he, desperately, because there was no book like it. All of his books uh, stand quite distinguished. The principles of classification that John Ray developed in the 17th century were largely ignored. The status quo was undisturbed. Botanists, farmers and gardeners had to struggle on with hearsay and superstition. Ray got the science right, but the publicity hopelessly wrong. When you have a good idea, you need to shout it from the rooftops. And that simply wasn't Ray's style. Modesty is a trait that could never be leveled at Sweden's most famous son of botany. The self-styled prince of the plant kingdom, Carl Linnaeus. His approach was about as far removed from that of John Ray as you could get. For Linnaeus, botany was all about sex. This is the student thesis of Carl Linnaeus. He called it an introduction to the courtship of plants. When Linnaeus wrote about the sexuality of plants, it wasn't only novel, it was shocking because he described the reproductive biology of plants as if they were humans indulging in licentious and shocking sex. This was just the first deliberately shocking step in the career of botany's first celebrity, the showman and genius that was Carl Linnaeus. I've come to Uppsala in Sweden, where Linnaeus began his extraordinary career. Linnaeus just scraped into Uppsala University to read medicine. He was a difficult, underachieving student, and medicine was regarded as an inferior subject. But while here, Carl became an expert in anatomy. Plant anatomy. While his fellow medical students concerned themselves with the gritty and bloody workings of the human body, Linnaeus saw only flowers. 
Linnaeus had been obsessed with the sex lives of plants ever since he'd been shown their reproductive bits and pieces at high school. So he would look at a plant like Euphorbia and he would find a male part, called a stamen, and a female part referred to as the pistil, both present in the same structure. But not all plants have the same number of sexual parts. When he opened up this blue salvia, he found two males and one female. The males are the two with the yellow pollen on them, and the female is the one with the blue tip. He looked in this penstemon, and when you look inside this one, he discovered not one, not two, but four stamens, but still only one female. And the more he studied, the more he became convinced that he'd found a way to classify the plant kingdom. He argued that nothing could be more fundamental to a plant's identity than its genitalia. He believed he could order the vast diversity of plants by their sexual parts alone. In the hallowed halls of learning across Europe, scientists were discovering the patterns and laws of their particular disciplines. But botany didn't have any, and now Linnaeus thought he'd found them. As he rather immodestly put it, God created, Linnaeus classified. For the next five years, Linnaeus continued to study identifying, counting, noting and describing the genitalia of plants. With his research completed, he was ready to publish. So here's Linnaeus's Systema Naturae, published in 1735, and for a book that changed the world. It's small, it's only 14 pages. I like to think of Linnaeus' work as like an 18th century computer spreadsheet. The most simple flower really is one that just has one stamen. So here in this column we have those with one stamen, and then once you've decided that, then there are two boxes in that column, those with one female and those with two females. Then the next column and boxes are those that have two males, and then all those plants with two males only ever have one female. But when you get into three stamens, then there are flowers that have one female, two females, or three females. It's beautifully neat and tidy. And it works simply from the left-hand side, starting with one stamen per flower, right the way across to where it's more than 20. Linnaeus knew if his system was to succeed, it had to be accepted in England which was the most important and influential horticultural market in Europe. He began on what can only be described as a full-on marketing campaign. He sent advanced copies of his Systema Naturae to the key players, and he set sail for England. When Linnaeus arrives here in London, he's not yet 30 years old. He has no money, he has no friends in high places yet, he's shabbily dressed, he doesn't even speak any English. And he carries this envelope with him with his address on it in case he comes lost or waylaid. All he had going for him was his incredible confidence. Soon after arriving in London, he headed for the headquarters of the Royal Society. Linnaeus assumed he'd have no trouble persuading the great and the good of the scientific world of the significance of his Systema Naturae. They'd welcome him with open arms. He'd then have access to all the important men of the kingdom. He couldn't have been more wrong. The doors of the Royal Society were shut firmly in Linnaeus's face. 
His marketing campaign failed spectacularly. The preview copies of his sexual system for ordering nature caused uproar, not because of the bold ideas, but because of the language Linnaeus used to express them. One critic condemned Linnaeus's whole system as loathsome harlotry because it was like a tour round the bedchambers of prostitutes. In effect, R. Carl had written the screenplay of a Swedish blue movie and the English were deeply offended. None of which mattered to our young botanical voyeur. He was convinced he was right and everyone else was wrong. And anyway, he'd come to England to meet just one person. The current holder of the title Linnaeus coveted. That of the greatest horticultural authority in Europe. His name was Philip Miller. Miller was a diligent gardener, and like Linnaeus, a determined self-promoter. A clash of egos was inevitable. Miller started his career as a lowly florist in the flower markets of London, awash with new plants from around the world. The arrival of this new wealth of plants brought great opportunities. But it also came with its own problems. What was causing consternation was the names. Take this plant, for example, known as American Wisteria, Wisteria fruescens, but also known as Mr. Catesby's New Climber, which is quaint, but it is not scientific. Every country had developed different names for its plants. These names even varied from region to region or from garden to garden. There were no universally agreed names. This made it impossible to share advice and growing tips when you didn't know if you were talking about the same plant. Philip Miller spied the chance to make his name. He would put an end to this confusion by regulating the naming of plants. To do this, he founded the Society of Gardeners. Once a month, they met at Newhall's Coffee House in Chelsea to discuss and name the flowers, trees and shrubs flooding in from the New World. The purpose of the society was to compare such things as should be received from abroad with those already in the English garden and to discover where the real differences, if any, lay. Philip Miller felt that their whole profession, the new science of botany, was in danger. He wrote, All the sciences have each their proper language, but botany alone has almost as many different languages as there are different authors. Miller believed that as the self-appointed most talented amongst their profession, the Society of Gardeners would soon compile a catalogue of all the foreign species growing in English gardens. Sadly, the society collapsed, overwhelmed by the enormity of the task. But it made Miller's name. He was appointed head of the most prestigious botanic garden in London, the Chelsea Physic Garden. As he began his work, Miller, who was never short of confidence, promised that Chelsea would soon outvie all other gardens in Europe. And he was probably right. In the 50 years Miller was here, he utterly transformed the garden. He was directly responsible for doubling the number of foreign species successfully grown in Britain. The purpose of a physic garden was to grow plants that had medicinal properties. 
But Miller went further. He developed the garden into a center of economic botany, growing cotton and roots used in the dye industry. A lot of the plants here have the second name Tinctorius, which implies that they were used as a dye. So here, for example, we've got Dyer's Weld, um, Reseda lotiola. Got um, Rivenus here for a red dye. And there's other dyed plants in here, like Woad, though now it's uh, being used as a, a treatment for cancer. So now you've got your dyes, uh, you've got to have something to dye. So here, lots of plants used for their fibres. So we've got sisal, for example, for, for rope. Um, Brucinetia used in Japan. And finally, one of the plants that changed the world, really, cotton. Hard to imagine the history of America being the same as it was with that, had it not been for the cultivation of cotton. Oh, really? Daniel Pretlove is one of the gardeners here at Chelsea. A name of the Physic Garden is to keep it looking as it did in Miller's time. We still keep, obviously, as you see here, the vegetable beds, the, the herbal beds, and um, the pharmaceutical beds have been set out as Miller had them in his time as oh, well. Were they? Yes, they, oh, they were reinstalled about 15 years ago, I think. He's a great person to have in your history, isn't he? He's such a major, oh, very, yes, major you know, figure in the yeah. history of. Uh, history of English gardening. Well, and he was here for such a long time and he changed the, yeah. the face of horticulture. Miller was an innovator. To grow the more exotic species, he set about designing glass houses with their own intricate heating systems. So Miller had glass houses. How did he heat them? They were coal-fired um, and they were quite elaborate structures. Did somebody have to stay up all night stoking the boilers? They usually had someone that, and it was usually what they call the undergardener then, yes. which was sort of the apprentice was the one yeah. that had to put out the fires and things like that. And uh, yeah, trainees today they don't know they, 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 they don't know they're just born today. Don't <laughs> know that they have such an easy time of it. That's right. In his day, Philip Miller was regarded as the most distinguished and influential gardener in Britain. But it wasn't simply for what he'd achieved here at Chelsea, it was for what he'd written. Miller took all the notes from the ill-fated Society of Gardeners and compiled the first comprehensive dictionary of gardening. Miller's book is this great bringing together of the knowledge of that time. He's gathering together names and horticultural practice and putting it in one place for the first time, everything you needed to know about every plant you were likely to find in an English garden was in one place. And it became really the standard work, the Bible, if you like. Miller simply listed everything, clearly and in alphabetical order. He made no attempt to classify. His dictionary, published in 1731, became the reference work for gardeners around the world. All the names given to the same plant were listed together, eliminating confusion. The dictionary gathered more credence and authority with every new edition. And it turned Philip Miller into a superstar. When you start on a new scientific venture, you must gather together all that is known about your subject. And that was Miller's great contribution. His dictionary brought order and focus to all the knowledge available at that time. His dictionary became an international bestseller. This is what brought Carl Linnaeus to the gates of Chelsea Physic Garden in 1736. Linnaeus wanted Miller to promote the sexual system of classification by including it in the next edition of the famous dictionary. But the meeting of the two egos was a frosty affair. Linnaeus, we know, was an opinionated sort of chap, but in Miller, he had found his match. Miller dismissed Linnaeus's classification system. He predicted that it will be of a very short duration. Linnaeus had hoped for Miller's support, 
Now he derided Miller's achievements as mere plant collecting. This was the beginning of a lifelong rivalry. So Linnaeus stared failure in the face. But there was one chink of light for the self-styled prince of botanists. Oxford. Linnaeus came here, to our botanic garden in Oxford, to see Johann Jacob Delenius, Professor of Botany. He had read Linnaeus' book and had not been convinced by it. As Linnaeus demonstrated his vast knowledge of plants and the beautiful simplicity of his sexual classification system, the two became firm friends. They were inseparable during Linnaeus' time in Oxford and they were to write to each other for the rest of their lives. When Linnaeus left, Delenius begged him under tears and kisses to live and die with him. He even offered to share his salary just to keep him in Oxford. Linnaeus had saved face. With the University of Oxford on his side, ready to accept his classification system, he could return to Sweden with his head held high. Who needed Philip Miller? Linnaeus arrived back in Uppsala with an ambitious plan to transform the Swedish economy. His confidence in his own abilities knew no bounds. However, he did raise sufficient funds to establish a new national botanic garden. And this is the result, the botanic garden at Uppsala, which Linnaeus had laid out according to his sexual system as it still is today. The plants are set out in beds according to how many sexual parts they have. I've wanted to visit Linnaeus' botanic garden for many years and see his work firsthand. Coming to Uppsala to Linnaeus' garden is a pilgrimage for any botanist. And seeing the plants laid out according to his sexual system really is a, a testament to the genius of the man and to his confidence that this was going to be the system that people would adopt. Just six years after his arrival in England as a penniless upstart, Linnaeus was now Professor of Botany at the University and the director of his own garden here at Uppsala, where he settled into a career of continued research and teaching. So here he could have stood, master of all he surveys. He had status, wealth and a crowd of adoring pupils who used to take on lively botanical trails. The original Linnaean trails have been reintroduced by Dr Mariette Manctelow of Uppsala University. I joined her for a spot of botanising. He was a marvellous teacher, he was really good, he was one of the best actually. He was very charismatic and people loved to listen to him. He really inspired his students. Yeah. So uh, these excursions, they weren't the subdued botanising that you would expect? No, they were fantastic because they could be like 100 students singing. And then they, they stopped at his professor's house and everybody shouted hooray for Linnaeus. They were very happy when they came back to town. So word spread that this was the, this is what you did. It's how you learnt botany. Was it? yeah. He had like hundreds of students coming with him on, on in the 1740s. It? it was on these very trails that Linnaeus identified a significant weakness with botany at the time. The names that were used for plants were very unwieldy. <laughs> 
On one of the journeys he made to Stockholm, he found this uh, trifolium. For example, as we walked, we came across this clover. Its name in Linnaeus' time was Trifolium orientale altissimum corle fistulosa flora albo. Here we have one of uh, those woodland plants that uh, Linnaeus that also saw here. Uh, and this is uh, viola. For Linnaeus and his students, this viola's full title was Viola floribus radicalibus corollatis abortientibus collinis a petalis semniferus. The problem was that these were descriptions of every minute detail of the plant. In this case, it translates as the short stemmed, free petaled fruiting violet. To teach, even just write down, these foot long names had become completely impractical. How do you carry out field biology like this if the name takes 30 seconds to say? Linnaeus set out to find a neat and easy way of naming plants, just as he thought he had found a neat and easy way of classifying them. What Linnaeus realised was that all a plant name had to do was designate. It did not need to describe. But a universal language was needed to do this, and that is what Linnaeus gave us. He came up with a beautifully simple set of rules. He reduced the lengthy plant names to just two words. The first word is like a manufacturer's name, and the second word refers to the models of the things they make. So, take Viola floribus radicalibus corallatis abortientibus corlinis a petalis semniferus. Becomes Viola mirabilis. Rather easier to remember, much quicker to write down, and very simple. Over the next two decades, Linnaeus applied his new two-name system to over 7,700 plants. When he published them in his next bestseller, Species Plantarum, it was a giant step forward for science. Whereas Miller had listed all the many names of every plant, Linnaeus had come up with a system for naming that was simple and short. So this is a catalogue of every plant name that has ever been used. And each species has all the names that have been used for that species, plus Linnaeus's new name, the short name, the two word name. And this really sets the precedent for standardization of names because without permanent names, there can be no permanence of knowledge. One after another, botanists and gardeners around the world accepted the new two-name or binomial system, turning to Linnaeus for the final decisions on what plants should be called. With the exception, that is, of a certain Philip Miller. Miller did not approve, railing instead that Linnaeus had the vanity of being the lawgiver. It was not until the eighth and last edition of Miller's Dictionary that Linnaeus's binomial system was finally included. In his autobiography, Linnaeus says that he did not think that the binomial system would be his legacy, but it was, and it's a big contribution. In fact, it's a colossal contribution. Thanks to Linnaeus, botanists around the world could now identify and classify plants teach, correspond and advance their science easily, efficiently, coherently. Here in the Botanic Garden in Oxford, as elsewhere, we still use Linnaeus's binomial naming system. Some plants Linnaeus named after his botanical heroes, thus immortalising them. But for his arch-rival Philip Miller, he had something else in mind. For Philip Miller, Linnaeus rather spitefully chose 
a rather weedy member of the daisy family, Malaria quinquiflora. Linnaeus believed there should be a connection between the botanist and the plant, and the outer stumpy petals of the malaria flowers are reputedly referred to Miller's somewhat plump figure. Now, Linnaeus has a reputation for being arrogant and a self-publicist, and yet the plant he chose to name after himself, the twin flower, or Linnea borealis, is a rather sweet, pretty little thing. And perhaps Linnea borealis is a very rare example of Linnaean modesty. Maybe he was human after all. Linnaeus's naming method was very successful and survives to this day. But the more botanists looked at his sexual system, the more flawed it appeared. There were inconsistencies and anomalies, things you just can't have in science. If you follow Linnaeus's system, you look at the flower of a lily, it has six male parts, it has three female parts. If you look at a yucca, it has six male parts, three female parts. The same is true of butcher's broom. Same is true of asparagus. And then you look at these plants and they are so totally different. In fact, the number of male and female parts can vary even among different flowers on the same plant. So it was not a reliable way to group plants. Through his obsession with plant genitalia and perhaps his arrogance, Linnaeus had ignored a fundamental flaw. His mistake was to focus on just one feature, the sexual organs of plants. As John Ray had warned nearly half a century earlier, any classification system has to take into account the whole plant. And as Linnaeus's system fell into disrepute, botanists began to rediscover the work of the long-forgotten John Ray. Amongst them was Philip Miller, who had the last laugh on his arch-rival. He had stood firm against the juggernaut of Linnaeus's self-promotion. Chelsea Physic Garden never embraced the sexual system of classification. Without question, Miller was the outstanding gardener of his age, but that doesn't mean he was popular. Despite his fame, not a single portrait of Miller exists, not even a sketch. Why? Because, like Linnaeus, he never underestimated his own ability, and he suffered fools not at all. So on his death, he left no friends to celebrate his achievements, but he left plenty of enemies who would rather forget he ever existed. The world of plants could be a brutal arena filled with colossal egos. It could also be a dangerous place if you wanted to push the boundaries. Britain was still a God-fearing society. The power of religious authorities remained a block on scientific advance. So if you were smart, you'd carry out your experiments well away from prying eyes. In 1716, a man called Thomas Fairchild makes his way furtively to his garden. He carefully closes the door of his potting shed and sets to work. He wants to try an experiment that has never been done successfully before. Thomas Fairchild was a successful nurseryman and at his nursery in Hoxton in North London, he sold not only British native species, but exotic plants that people had sent him. But his supplies were unreliable, so he decided to take nature into his own hands. Behind closed doors, Fairchild turned creator. He wasn't interested in classification, and he didn't want to improve an existing flower. He wanted to create an entirely new plant so that he could sell blooms that his rivals didn't have. Fairchild was about to create 
an artificial hybrid flower, a plant that couldn't be found in nature. He had prepared two flowers, a carnation and a sweet william. He took male pollen from the sweet william and he placed it on the female part of the carnation. And then he waited. He waited until the carnation produced seeds. Then he sowed them. This was the true test. When his hybrid seeds grew into plants and then burst into flower, he knew he'd succeeded. To dry and preserve his new plant, he cut the stem of the ruffled pink bloom and pressed it carefully between two sheets of paper. And this is the result. This simple specimen isn't much to look at, but for botanists like me, it's a milestone. The world's first scientifically created hybrid. But when he finally emerged, clutching his sample, it was not in triumph, but in dread. Fairchild knew that most of his contemporaries were still enthralled to the story of creation in the Bible. God had made all the species of plant and animal, and that was that. 300 years ago, Thomas Fairchild thought he had created a new species and his guilt was immense because he had cast doubt on the story of the creation and his reaction to assuage his guilt was to make a benefaction to this church in Shoreditch so that an annual sermon could be preached to glorify the work of creation. He knew how important his discovery was. He had made a new plant, and that should not have been possible. He knew that man's relationship with plants would never be the same again. It was nearly four years before Fairchild dared tell the world about his experiment. On the 4th of February, 1720, he made his way anxiously to the headquarters of the Royal Society in London. He presented his pressed flower to the great and good of the scientific world, fearful of the reaction he might receive. The experiment by Mr. Fairchild found a plant of a middle nature between a sweet william and carnation gillyflower, a specimen that produced no seed but is barren like the mule. These are the minutes of the meeting when Fairchild came to the Royal Society and he really didn't need to worry. The members of the Royal Society were able to see beyond the faded colours of this now famous exhibit and realise the significance. The fellows of the Royal Society were not so much concerned with the Bible as they were excited by the possibilities that the hybrid presented. But there was a problem. Fairchild's hybrid could not produce seeds. It was sterile. Nobody knew why. For all the progress made from the steps towards classification and understanding the sex lives of plants to the first plant dictionary and a universal naming system, still botanists could not answer this fundamental question. Why was Fairchild's mule sterile? What was the missing piece of the jigsaw that would enable plant scientists to create fertile hybrids, better plants, stronger crops, more efficient medicines? The missing link was an understanding of how different plant species evolved. This missing link arrived in the shape of Charles Darwin and his book on the origin of species. Botany was a passion of Darwin's. 
he demonstrated that plants have the ability to adapt to their surroundings and as a result can increase their chances of survival. He'd set sail in 1831 on board the HMS Beagle. As the ship's naturalist, he was fascinated by the diversity of plant life he found in the Southern Hemisphere. Darwin saw that flowers, which are pollinated by the wind, have little color, while those that need to attract insects are brightly colored. For over a decade, he observed plants and carried out experiments. He understood that natural selection applied as much to plants as it did to animals. The theory of evolution, Darwin's theory of evolution, finally published in 1859, may have put the cat amongst the pigeons in Victorian religious circles, but for botanists, it was like manna from heaven. It was like finding the Holy Grail because it explained everything. 19th century botanists recognized the significance of Darwin's work on how and why plants evolved into different groups. In his notes for the book, Darwin uses this illustration. It's the metaphor of a tree showing how species diverged as they evolved. Growing from a central trunk, some branches dying out, others sprouting further growth. The newest twigs and leaves far, far away from the roots, but still connected. The origin of species changed everything. Darwin explained why we can classify plants. The plants in a well-defined natural group share a common ancestor. He explained why plants with fewer things in common are more distantly related and why plants that have a lot in common are more likely to produce fertile offspring. Botanists now understood why Fairchild's experiment 150 years earlier had failed. The plant he bred was sterile because the carnation and the sweet william come from two distinct species. They're not closely related enough to breed successfully. This understanding of the importance of classification underpins all botanical science to this day. I've come to probably the most famous botanic garden in the world, Kew Gardens. It's where I trained as a gardener. The work begun by Miller, Linnaeus, Fairchild and John Ray continues here. Now, simple field lenses are supplemented by 21st century tools such as scanning electron microscopes and DNA analysis. The work to define and classify plants is as vital as ever. One of the scientists here, Professor Monique Simmons, came across a plant in Ghana that was being used to treat malaria. She was curious to see if there was any scientific basis for the treatment. The plant belongs to the same family as sage. The herbarium archive at Kew found 300 species in the same group, 62 of which have also been used in traditional medicines. Professor Simmons identified her specimen as Plectranthus barbatus and began a chemical analysis she found a totally new anti-malarial compound. The active compounds that we're looking at appear to be in the glandular hairs on the leaves. Right. And when you stress the plant, when you cut it back, the leaves that then regrow seem to have a higher concentration of the active compounds. That was encouraging, but was Plectranthus barbatus the best source of the antimalarial compound? 
Could other related species produce more of the compound or a more potent version? Before we develop the project further, we want to make sure that we've got the most effective species. If you look at the plants and you've got some surrounders here, mm. are the ones that are similar related or are the ones that are uh. diverse in style related? And the molecular data can give us an insight into one species and it's kind of near neighbours. Mm. And near neighbours will most likely therefore sh share a similar type of chemistry. The molecular data is the DNA fingerprinting? The DNA fingerprinting is what we're using here as the molecular data. The leaves of the Plectranthus are ground in a pestle and mortar, dipped in a hot bath mixed with chloroform, then shaken and spun. The sediment is removed and when ethanol is added, the strands of DNA are visible even to the naked eye. The sample is then frozen along with another 40,000 that make up an extraordinary database at Kew. By comparing this DNA with that of other species of Plectranthus, Professor Simmons and the team at Kew were able to come up with a precise family tree showing the nearest relatives to her original specimen. The DNA tree has enabled us to identify four or five other species that actually might contain similar or more active compounds. And that's what the exciting part of the project mm. at the moment, because that's what our, we're putting our, mm. our, our efforts into. We'd really like to find a new antimalarial that could therefore serve as a platform for development of a new drug. That would really be exciting. The Malaria Project demonstrates how valuable it is to understand the connections between plants. Incredible to think how far we've come since the early pioneers. Ray, with his hand lens, could only study plants from the outside. But now, with modern equipment, we can look from the inside outwards. The ability to harness and manipulate plants was made possible by the classification of the plant kingdom. And the importance of botany and those early pioneers cannot be overstated. I know you'd expect me to say that, but it's true. Next time on Botany, A Blooming History, I'll be looking at how botanists wrestled with the question of what plants do with water, sunlight and carbon dioxide the amazing process known as photosynthesis. Celebrating a little piece of heaven in a bustling world next tonight on BBC4 as historian Michael Collins seeks out our everyday Eden with a potted history of the suburban garden. <laughs>